With over 35 years of ministry, Mount Zion Church is located in Clarkston, Michigan. You may have seen us while driving in I-75, just north of Great Lakes Crossing. We invite you today to join us as we go inside to hear a fresh and relevant word in this new day. Mount Zion, helping you experience the best of life. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the prophet Isaiah said, and of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. It's been happening and we're living in the culmination of all things. Now, this next verse of scripture is significant because it says, but the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth, swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. But he went out to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How do you know that's talking about us? So we have to understand that we shouldn't be surprised that there's conflict in life. We shouldn't be surprised that there's spiritual conflicts that we should go through, understanding that God is always aware of what's going on and that God will use every circumstance for the good. Not everything is good. But ultimately, the Bible says concerning the seed of the woman, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life to the death. This is the theme of the book of the Revelation. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I don't know about you, but I've decided I'm going to be an overcomer in this life. Amen? We got to know that. And you can't be a victim and a victor at the same time. You always have to understand, if you want to be victorious, you can't see yourself as a victim. You have to say, wait a second, I know what my God can do. Now, this next verse of scripture I read from the text today, to me, is the prophetic word for this moment in time. I was hearing it the other day, and Pastor Rich was telling me when he was in a time of prayer, this, the Lord had spoke the same word to him a couple of weeks ago. We received about the same time. It says, According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury for his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, read this last part with me. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. How many glad that the Lord can lift up a standard? That's what the prophecy of the revelation said. That's what this prophecy declares. Though the enemy said a flood against you, you need to know something. The Lord can cause something to swallow it up if you would. But I really believe with all my heart, this is also God saying to the church, this is a time to recognize we are the standard that the Lord is raising up to swallow that flood, to come against those things. This is a day when God's saying it's time for the sons of God to arise in the earth, knowing the authority that the Father has put in their hands. It is a time of help. But it's also a time of action when we, the body of Christ, need to stand up. We can see it in the world in which we live. And Isaiah chapter 59 talks about how there's injustice in the land. The things that used to be good are said to be bad. And people are promoting bad things. We're living in a time when immorality and injustice is increasing in the earth in many, many different ways. There's such conflict and adversity, but we, the people of God, need to know it's time, it's time, it's time. The standard is being raised in Zion. The standard of the Lord is being raised among his people. He's calling each and every one of us to recognize that and to realize that we have a part to play in these things. Now, this next verse of Scripture I want to share takes us to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this is the Apostle Paul who's writing the letter to the church in Corinth. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, we have to understand that we're in the midst of a conflict, and we have to know what he says. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 
In other words, the weapons that God has for us to use are not the same weapons that the world is using. I remember in church we used to sing this song, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, and they are mighty and they are mighty is what the song said, and we're going to cast down, and we got all excited about this, and in thinking about them as spiritual versus carnal, my vision was basically this stronghold filled with demons, and we're going to tear that stronghold down through prayer and spiritual things, And, and, and when you read this scripture, you have to understand something That's not exactly what it's saying when the Apostle Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal as you read it in the context of what he's saying. Notice verse 5, casting down arguments. That'll be 375, sir. How much? I said that'll be 375. Oh, you must be thinking about just the popcorn. How much is everything? No, that covers all of it. Really? The Mount Zion Cinema offers you an affordable night out at the movies. For a list of all upcoming movies and showtimes, visit us at mountzion.org. So, babe, you seem to be enjoying the movie. Yeah, I just can't believe how little I paid for all this. I'm gonna go and get some more popcorn. You see, the Apostle Paul was actually in a debate. He was in a debate with the church at Corinth. He was the founder of the church, and in his absence, there were a lot of things that were happening that were contrary to what he had taught them and instructed them. And so he was writing them letters, trying to set everything in order, and people were saying among themselves, and also even publicly, as a matter of fact, oh, that Apostle Paul, you know, he's not that great of a preacher, he's not that good of a speaker, and wow, he can write these big, bold letters, but when he's with us, he doesn't write those bold letters, he's he, he just this meek, passive person, and they were just cutting him down, and he's basically saying to them, I'm not like you think I am, and don't compare me to natural abilities, don't matter whether I'm a good speaker, it doesn't matter if I'm bold in the natural, doesn't matter because I'm not fighting with spiritual warfare weapons, or I'm not fighting with natural or carnal things, I'm fighting with spiritual things, but he wants them to understand, but when I come, I'm going to cast down those arguments you have. In other words, when I get there, there's going to be a debate There's going to be an argument, and in this debate, I'm going to tear down the strongholds of your thinking, because sometimes we have mindsets that hinder the move of God. And when we think about tearing down those strongholds, we have to understand that one aspect of that literally is hearing the truth, somebody speaking that truth, and then tearing down the mindsets that hinder us. So it's important to understand that the Lord literally, the other day I was sleeping and woke up with this scripture in mind, and the Lord told me, go back and read this. He said, you have to understand, you're living in a time when there are going to be a lot of arguments or debates in the land, and my people have to enter into the debate. We understand there are spiritual gifts and power that he's given to us, but we also have to understand that I'm going to send my people into the realms of the world and I'm going to cause them to be a light and I'm going to cause them to be a witness. And they have to understand that there is a spiritual aspect to what's going to be behind what they're doing. But you got to realize we got to go where the rubber meets the road. We have to understand that we got to stand for the truth. We have to know the truth and we have to speak the truth. And in that sense, it's like getting into the debates of life because there is a debate. 
Oftentimes in the charismatic movement, it's promoted that the best form of evangelism is through power demonstration. So they'll say that, well, you know, we meet, need more signs and wonders and miracles. And I've even heard about prophetic evangelism, how that if we go using these gifts and displaying these things of power, we'll be able to have influence on the world. Well, we at Mount Zion believe in miracle signs and wonders. We have a miracle service. We believe in miracles. I've had a couple of miracles. I, right before service, somebody come up and said, I had a miracle. What the doctor said should kill me it has been reversed. How many you know God works miracles? Amen. <laughs> but in this third day, we have to understand that does not sway public opinion. When Moses went to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, he worked 10 miracles. Now, we typically call them the plagues, but they were miracles. And did it sway Egypt at all? No. God finally was able to get them out, but even then, the Egyptians were chasing them down. So the 10th miracle most of us know about is he opened up the Red Sea, the Pharaoh went in there, and the Red Sea buried them. The children of Israel saw all of those miracles, and when they got in the wilderness, it wasn't long at all before they were murmuring and complaining, saying, why did God bring us out of here? Now, I don't know about you, but in my mind, I think, if I would have saw the Red Sea part, Pharaoh's army drowned in that, how many know you would think that would sustain you for just a little bit? Come on, how, how many know you would think that would be true? But in human nature, it typically is not true. We are more concerned about today's need. The fact is most people who've experienced miracles, if they hold on to it, it they can have a testimony and get excited about it. But in the end, it doesn't sway the opinions. Moses would pray and say, oh, Lord, the people are complaining. God would send miracle after miracle, but it never swayed them. Upon her head a planted hive of straw, which fortified her visage from the sun, where on the thought might think, sometime it saw, the carcass of beauty, spent and done. Life is a performance. Do it well. For more information on our theater program, go to mountzionarts.org. When does a latte become the remedy for a long day? Or a booth, the gathering place for old friends? When can a class provide answers to life's hardest questions? It happens when a place becomes committed to improving the most important thing in your life, you. The district just one mile north of Great Lakes Crossing, where life happens better. Jesus performed miracles and crowds of people gathered around, no question about that. But when he spoke the truth recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 5, you know what happened? The Bible says that everybody left. Jesus said, where are all these people? Where are they all going? He said to his own disciples, are you leaving too? And they basically said, well, we don't have anywhere to go. So they stayed with him. The crowd started coming back again, but when it came time for the crucifixion, no one was there. All of the apostles worked miracles as a sign and wonder to minister to people, and there's no question we believe in all these things, but in the end, to sway the people of our country, we have to understand that part of that is getting into the debate of life recognizing that we have to be able to speak the truth in love in the world in which we live, and we have to understand that it won't always be a popular thing, but we have to realize that we have to get involved in the debate. And we have to understand how important that is for the world because the world's looking for people who will stand up and say, well, I want to tell you what the Word of God says. The world needs somebody to stand up and say, there is a way that seems right unto men, but the end thereof is the way of death. The people you know that don't know Christ need somebody to stand up to them and say, I want to tell you about what God says about these matters. Anybody with me here today, how important that is to understand? 
And, and, and so God's saying to the church, it's time to enter into the debate and recognize that there is going to be some conflict, just like we've talked about prophetically, as you enter into the debate, but we have to understand how important these things are. Now, in this next verse of Scripture, it also is from the Corinthian letter. Paul writes to them, he said to them, I couldn't speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food until now you were not able to receive it and even now you're still not able for you are still carnal for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like what? Mere men. Now, you might say we're mere people, but that isn't what the Bible says. The Bible says that when we are born again, we become the children of the Most High God. The Bible says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The Bible says we are the children of God, the sons of God, the anointed of God. Church, it's time for us to know who we are. We're not just mere men, so to speak. And that word would be mankind, mere women, mere men. We have to understand who we are in the world in which we live, and we should not be having church or our relationships based on the same principles of the world. We have to understand we're different. As he opens chapter 1 of the book of Corinthians, he says, you know, you guys have all the spiritual gifts in operation. You have the best of preachers, the best of teachers. He's still talking to them as babes because they didn't understand how to bring the natural and the spiritual together how that they were to take that which is of the spiritual and began to institute it into their lives. So spiritual is defined by what our motivation. I'm not being spiritual only when I pray in the spirit or have a spiritual gift. I'm being spiritual when my motivation is according to the spirit of the living God and I'm walking in that power. And he wrote to the Corinthian church and said, you know what, you you can operate from time to time your spiritual realms, but everyday living, it's, it's not happening. You need to understand why I've given to you the Holy Spirit. This next verse of Scripture is very significant because the apostle says, I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, this is backing up in the scriptures where he sets the the background for this weapons of our warfare because he's telling them, I don't come like everybody else comes. I walk like Jesus Christ. How many know we're supposed to walk like Jesus Christ? Jesus came in meekness. He came in gentleness because he wasn't trying to beat people over the head. He wasn't trying to make things happen. And that's the spirit by which we should be the people that enter into the debate, if you would. But he said, I want you to understand something that we have to realize that we're not walking according to the world, but we have to engage the world if we're going to have the impact we're supposed to have. Now, it's interesting when he says he's pleading with them because that word literally means to call to one side the helper or comforter. Now, if you know anything about the scriptures in the New Testament, you understand that I'm telling you that word plead there is the same word speaking about the Holy Spirit. If you enjoy dancing, be sure to check out Mount Zion School of Performing Arts. From hip-hop to ballet, we have it all, and starting as early as ages three up through adult. Whether you're a beginner or advanced, we have something for you. So check us out online at mountzionarts.org.
And the Holy Spirit was given for us as a comforter, as a helper. Look at these next verses of Scripture and see what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. It says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The word convict means to convince, literally means to tell a fault, rebuke, or reprove, and even make you feel guilty. Now, we have to understand something. When we receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is inside of us, how many know that the Holy Spirit can give us communications from heaven? And I don't know about you. How many out there have the Holy Spirit? You say, amen, brother, and I have the Holy Spirit. Now, how many know if you have the Holy Spirit, sometimes the Holy Spirit tells you you shouldn't be doing something? Is that true or not? Sometimes you'll feel, a, I call it a check of my sphere. Somebody asked me to do something this week, and I went through it, and I'm like, I have a check of my sphere. I can't exactly tell you why right now, but I just know I can't do it because the Holy Ghost is saying, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. So when I hear that, feel that check, sometimes I just don't do it, and sometimes I say, well, give me some time. I'm going to think about it. But the Holy Spirit can do that. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will rebuke you. How many know sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, you shouldn't have did that? Anybody out there have the same Holy Ghost that I do? If the Holy Ghost never does or says anything to you contrary, you're ignoring the Holy Ghost. Because you have to understand that how does he help us? The Holy Spirit comes to help us by encouraging us, exhorting us, reproving us, and telling us sometimes we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Some of you might say, well, that reminds me of somebody I have in my life. Amen? Amen. Well, the word helper is the same one used of a woman in Genesis chapter 2 who was given as someone who would help Adam. If in the Garden of Eden, the woman would have been a debater when the devil said, you should need of that tree, she wouldn't have just said, but God said, she would have said, but devil, you need to know something. How many know she should have debated there? How many know there's a time when you need to talk up? And when she took the fruit of that tree to her husband, and the Bible just says, and he ate. Come on, you couldn't have been that hungry, Adam. Couldn't you have you stopped for just a minute and said, should we be doing this? Come on. If we allow contentions in our life and opposing voices, there's a much better chance we're going to do the right thing. We're going to be encouraged to do something that we don't want to do. That's why the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so should a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. So God puts people in our lives. Why? So that they can add to us what we have need of in order that we would do and pursue the right course. Now, the world we're living in today even is trying to put it on parents to say, you shouldn't try to mold your children. You should just let them be who they are. And don't, don't try to put any structure. Just let them be, let them be, let them be. No, as a parent, how many of you know you have responsibility to do some Holy Ghost stuff? Come on. We need to be a people that understand that. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. He said, I'm an apostle, and this is the spiritual thing. I'm the guy who's got to tell you what the word of the Lord says. You need to understand something. Because in that, if you would, argument or debate, as Christians, we're able to have the best in our family. We're able to have the best in the church. So, so many times people say, oh, I don't want to go to church. You know, there's conflicts. It's supposed to have conflict. Not the Bible says if you, if you do things in the wrong way, the Bible says God's going to judge you. But we have to understand that God can use all things, even things we don't like. So God says we have to understand how the process works, and if we are able to have it happen in our lives in the church, then we become fine-tuned to go out there in the world and begin to share with them the reality of the world according to the Word of God. All right, that'll be 375, sir. How much? I said that'll be three seventy-five. Oh, you must be thinking about just the popcorn. How much is everything? No, that covers all of it. Really? The Mount Zion Cinema offers you an affordable night out at the movies. For a list of all upcoming movies and showtimes, visit us at mountzion.org. So, babe, you seem to be enjoying the movie. Yeah, I just can't believe how little I paid for all this. I'm going to go and get some more popcorn. When does a latte become the remedy for a long day? Or a booth, the gathering place for old friends? 
when can a class provide answers to life's hardest questions? It happens when a place becomes committed to improving the most important thing in your life, you. The District, just one mile north of Great Lakes Crossing, where life happens better. Now, this next verse of scripture is significant. It says, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will what? Know the truth. And what will the truth do? How many know we need truth? We need truth. We need that which is true. And this is so important all the time. Now, how many know if you are in an argument, it feels so good if you're right? How many like to win an argument? Well, I want to tell you how to be a winner in every argument. How many want in on that one? Oh, bad Lord. Lord. Now, notice I said you can be a winner in every argument. Now, you can win every argument. You see, if you go into an argument trying to be right, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. And when you're wrong, somebody's going to say, oh, well, I was right. But if you go into an argument looking for truth, how many of you know you always come out a winner? Amen? That's what God says to his people. And, and, and that's so important for us to understand that principle. When Jesus Christ came, the religious people wanted to be right. That's why they rejected Jesus, because they didn't understand the conflict of truth. And because of that, when God was moving in a new way, what happened? They couldn't receive it because they were right. And when you think you're right, you always want to be right. When somebody else comes up with another suggestion, you're going to be like, I'm right. And when you have that attitude, you're never going to be able to receive what it is that God is speaking for the new day and for the things that he wants to speak. But when you say, I'm a person who wants the truth, then you can receive everything that comes, and you certainly should filter it. You certainly should learn by these things. But we always have to understand that we should buy truth and sell it not, according to the scriptures. Because why? When you know the truth, it will set you free. And this is what the world needs today, church. They say they're free, they're not free. It's becoming more and more a bondage, and oftentimes people don't know it. But church, when we go forth knowing and understanding truth, proclaiming truth, and living truth, the world is going to be able to receive something powerful from us. And that's why I believe with all my heart the Lord's speaking to me and he, he's saying to all of us, this is a time when we have to be those who love the truth, are willing to pay the price for truth and recognize great freedom will come to us. Now, one of the things I believe will happen, I won't, don't have time to talk about, I actually thought this next verse of scripture would be my main thought today. In this, the prophet declares that God is saying, put me in remembrance let us contend together, state your case, that you may be acquitted. Literally, God's saying, you can debate with me. And when you come to the closet of prayer, you can say to me, but God, remember what you said, and God, this is what's happening. How many would want to have that kind of a place in prayer? We really can, but that's for mature Christians, amen? That's not for people to just say, I want what I want when I want it. You're not going to go to God and think he, he's going to be moved at all. But when we come to the place of his maturity working in us, this next verse of scripture in closing is to me very significant because I believe this with all my heart that the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor the mouth of your descendants' descendants. How many know that's power, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore? Can we all please bow our heads? God has anointed Pastor Lauren to reach the church with a fresh message for this day. If you would like further information, we also invite you to visit us on the web at mountzion.org, where you can hear more of Pastor Lauren's messages and find out about our ministries. If you're visiting the Metro Detroit area, we invite you to worship with us at Mount Zion Church. Thanks again for watching.